Hi everyone, welcome to Mentoring Developers. This is a podcast and YouTube show for you. If you are new to software development, if you want to be a software developer and you really don't know what to do, this is a place for you to be. And today I have a very, very special guest, Rocky Latka, and he has achieved so much in his life. He has done everything that I would want to do and more. And I don't know if I can or anybody can keep up with him, but there's so much to talk about, but we really want to know how he got started because there is a very interesting story in how he actually started programming. He didn't have access to computers at home. He had to do something, he had to do something sneaky. So let's ask him. Hi, Rocky. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing great. Thank you for that. Uh, yeah, but when I started, uh, you know, home computers did not yet exist. Uh, and when I was probably around 14 years old, give or take, uh, you know, I, the, our high school, well, our middle school and high school was and still to this day is one big building. And uh, the, the computers, well, the computer that we had access to is <laughs> a, um, a mainframe. I'm not even sure where it was, but we would dial into it uh, using, uh, it's almost hard to do, but, but a, you, you dial the phone, like a rotary phone. Mm -hmm. Boy, that's old. But then you <laughs> stick the headset into the suction cup thing oh, so wow. you could do the modem sounds. Um, and then it was a paper terminal. And uh, uh, so I would sneak in there, uh, you know, in between classes or uh, after math class. My math teacher was uh, very um, supportive. <laughs> And so he'd be like, "Well, <clears throat> you know, you got your uh, you got your math assignments done. So why don't you just you know quietly go out the back of the back of the room and and uh, uh, spend time on the computer?" And uh, yeah, so but yeah, so it was a little sneaky. What else did I do? Oh, I, um, I uh, I joined track, um, and and I did do some uh, you know track. I, I was successful uh, for a while doing high jump and some things like that. But wow. A lot of the reason I joined track was because I could sneak off and get at least an hour or so uh, in the computer room because we lived um, 14 miles outside of town. And so uh, I needed access to what was called the, the activity bus uh, to get home. <laughs> <laughs> so I would uh, sneak, I would, I would join sports primarily so I could get into the computer room. Wow. Um, and then have access to this bus to get me home after, uh, after those activities. I've heard a lot of stories. I've never heard a story like that. <laughs> Someone doing sports so that they can actually do computers. Um, that's funny. But, but here's, this is, this is, uh, I think important for our listeners to know because right now it's so easy. Everybody has a computer. Everybody has a phone. You can do so many things with it. You don't know what to do, right? You, you we have a problem of too many options. We have, too much entertainment. So when you have a computer at home, for instance, I have a daughter, she's 10 years old, and I'm trying to convince her to do some programming. And she's interested, she has learned a few things. But it's hard because it seems like such a nice entertainment device. To give up that and to do this is hard. So uh, people um, of your generation, people of my generation who have maybe lived before the the internet era you things were slow so it was a little bit easier but 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 i want to know what kind of things you were able to do as a, a programmer you know when you were in school what could you do because i'm sure you were not doing graphical things you're not making video games maybe were you well actually um I was because my my first what what hooked me um, with that mainframe was a um, what what's what called a mud a multi user dungeon a text based right. um, multi user adventure um, where you would log into the system and uh, explore a little town and fight monsters and <clears throat> talk to other humans that were doing the same thing at the same time and. Uh, that caught my imagination. And so I actually started writing. I'm like, Oh, I could do this too. And so I started writing my own, um, 
multi-user dungeon software. Um, and uh, none of that ever panned out until years <laughs> later when I was in college. Um, but, uh, which is, that's how I met my wife in some ways is through, but, but anyway, that's a different story. Wow. Uh, that's another interesting but, story. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, it, it, so yeah, actually my, my original hook into what, what motivated me, um, was, was games like that. And, um, this was also, uh, the time when, if you, if you watch, uh, a lot of movies from the, so uh, late seventies and into the eighties, this was when the arcades were a big deal. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and I fell in love with arcade games and, uh, uh, multiplayer. I remember very vividly. In fact, when, uh, I first encountered a multiplayer asteroids game where there were two asteroids oh. games that were somehow magically connected so that, um, the two players could see each other's ships on the screen at the same time. That's two different two different uh, machines, but they're yes. connected. Wow! Yeah, yeah, it was that, it was different from you know at the time most multiplayer had a spot for player one and player two. Right, but right. This actually had two complete consoles that were uh, well. Now I know they were networked back then. Yeah. Like, wow, this is magic. <laughs> you know? Yeah, but and, uh, it 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 uh, just totally fascinated me, and I wanted mm. to understand how it worked and how to do it myself. <laughs> Well, that's amazing. So, a question that I have to ask you is, why were you interested in computers and programming to begin with? Most kids aren't. Most kids weren't back then, and they still aren't. So, what got you interested in particular? Yeah, that's a little hard to define, I think. Yeah, I, I grew up in a rural area, um, and... Uh, you know, my uh, grew up uh, as a woodsman. Uh, my my father was uh, a game warden or a conservation officer, and so fishing and boating and you know just every everything to do with being out on lakes and in forests. And it turns out that in real life, an awful lot of what happens when you're out doing that sort of thing is that you have to repair motors and uh, you have to. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, you have to really understand how things work. And when things go wrong, you have to figure out how to troubleshoot them so you can fix them because you live yeah, more or less in the middle of nowhere. And uh, you can't just buy a new one or b go buy a part. You have to figure out how to solve a problem. And I, I credit it to, in my mind at least, this is the same thought process that I use every day when I'm writing software. Right. It's like, how do I, I've got a problem. Let's, let's trace that problem back to its origin. And then from there work forward as to like, how can I fix the problem or make it better? Right. And I don't know if this is true. This is just the way I view my history is I think, yeah, you know, my parents, especially my dad was, was and is still not a computer person. Right. <laughs> it's just, he's an outdoorsman. Um, but all of the repairing of tractors and lawnmowers and uh, I don't know, figuring out all that stuff. Um, you know, as soon as I found computers, it's, it was like a way of, of exercising all the same sort of skills. Um, but in a, in a, at the time in a way that almost nobody did. I mean, um, I was just recently, uh, having a conversation and now I was, recently but now he's passed away but with uh, one of my high school math teachers and he and i were simultaneously him and as, as an adult and me as as a teenager were simultaneously learning self-teaching how to program uh and and we would trade ideas off e each other um like like you know inventing bubble sort on your own um, oh, wow yeah you know, which you think about it now, it's like, yeah, it's not that hard. But but the key concept of a bubble sort is that temporary variable where you take the thing and mm -hmm. put it off on the side. Right. Neither of us had that idea. And and I remember us sitting in, in the classroom, just the two of us, right, <laughs> trying to figure this out. Going, oh, that's how you do it. You know? <laughs> and uh, Wow. <laughs> but, um, well, but I mean, that, that shows just, I guess, you know, back at that point in time i suppose that was around 1980 give or take um how rare this sort of knowledge uh right was and so to me it was like a new frontier it was exciting 
Yeah, I can completely understand. This is, this really is, uh, you know, charting a new path. When, especially if you don't have anybody else that you can follow. If your if your dad were doing the same thing, then you you just follow dad. I've seen this a lot. People follow uh, their uh, you know their parents or their uncles. But when you are the first one to do everything, then then that becomes hard. So so I understand that you got started. You were interested in programming and problem solving, and it was exciting. It was a new frontier, and all that is good. But time passes then interests change and i would expect it i would have expected that after a couple of years you would have moved on and picked up another hobby but my guess is that you didn't that you stuck with it all the way through high school and then maybe got into college did you go to college for to study computer science yes in the end i did um you, you're right i my my other big passion uh was aircraft mm. and uh, so actually i i when i graduated from high school i went into the air force with the intent of becoming a pilot and uh i ended up with uh, some health issues plus it turns out there are height restrictions um and i'm too tall <laughs> oh i didn't know that so, was a thing yeah that's a it's a very real thing and and people that in my case, end up being like six five or six six, you know, two meters tall. Um, <laughs> don't fit inside of uh, most aircraft. So, oh wow! Um, but in any, in, in the end, I you know had medical issues that was unable to do that. So I uh, left the Air Force and then went to a school back in Minnesota and did in fact get a computer science degree. So, um, and I still love aircraft to to this day, <laughs> but. Uh, <laughs> Um, you know, so, so you're right. I, I, it was not my sole, um, kind of focus in, in life, but it, uh, okay. it, it, it never waned. I mean, I have, I fell in love when I was a teenager and, and, uh, to, to this day having, you know, uh, like, like you said in the introduction, I've been doing this a long time. I've, I've had quite a long career. I still love it. You know, there are just aspects of this that, that just I I wake up in the morning. I'm like, hey, today is a programming <laughs> day. I actually get to have fun. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, <laughs> this this is amazing. Yeah, this is one of those professions where I've seen people, so many people who have been doing this for so many years, they're close to retirement or maybe they never want to retire because they love the creative process and solving problems so much. That's just a, a real gift for to be able to do that. So, you went through college when you were when you were doing the computer science degree. Were you also working somewhere, internships, getting some actual work experience, or were you just involved in academia and just doing assignments that you're assigned? Yeah, so. You know, times are different now than they were when I was, you know, so when I was in college, um, I had saved up money from jobs that I had done through high school. And, uh, and I also worked, uh, during the school year and a lot during the summers, uh, to pay, I had to pay my way through college. Right. Um, and I was able to get some scholarships and, and I don't even know if these still exist, but back then we had a thing called Pell Grants. Where the the government would um, give grants to students, that it, it had to meet certain criteria, but it was uh, not a loan; it was a grant. Um, and uh, so, all the way through my college, I worked in order to pay my way through, and didn't work in the computer field. I worked. I, I well, I fell in love with working in hardware stores. To be honest, that's and maybe that's a problem solving thing again cuz in small town hardware stores yeah. which are hard to find hard to find these days but you know people would come in and say you know i i got a problem I, my my sink doesn't work and um and again i grew up fixing a lot of things and so it, but it was fun right you'd you'd talk and say oh well this is probably what you need to fix that problem or right so it was yeah. still a kind of problem solving i guess um anyway i loved it um but, you know, I also, um, I and a group of probably four friends, we, we started the first uh, uh, 
computer club at our university uh, at the time. And, and then we got ourselves affiliated with the ACM, the Association for Computing Machinery, mm-hmm. uh, which is fairly academic, but still it was a, a mid sense. Right. 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 Um, and uh, and then my between my junior and senior year, I did get an internship uh, working at the Minneapolis airport and uh, not a computer internship. But I was able to turn it into one because what mm-hmm. we were doing was collecting data on uh, noise, pol- basically noise pollution from aircraft and, and ridership of some of the mm-hmm. transit systems inside the airport. All of that needed to be analyzed. And so I was able to use a lot of my computer skills to either write software or use spreadsheets to analyze that data. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, so I, I mean, I think part of, at least in that case, right. it was... I took the initiative to transform one thing into another so right. that it, it was still, you know, pretty fun. Yeah, I think this is a great lesson to be learned for people who are just coming in. If you're in college right now, if you're even if you're in high school, if you get a chance to do an internship, you may be able to actually carve out a project for yourself because a lot of times when companies are offer internships, they don't really know what they want. And sometimes they don't know what you can do. So like, like you did, it happens all the time because even so, more so today, these days, because everything is getting computerized, automated, and there's some kind of technology need somewhere. And yep. I've seen it again. You, they may hire you for this one thing, and then you you knock it out in two weeks, and they're like, "Oh, you, he's actually good." So then they may move you to something else because you know they have you because it's it's e- economical for them to hire interns. <laughs> sometimes, yeah, that's right. sometimes we make uh, as cor- as companies we we make interns do uh, the same job as full time developers. It, it, sometimes they're good, sometimes even better than regular employees. So I've seen that. <laughs> yeah. So well, my, just recently, within the last yeah. few years, my younger son uh, got an uh, internship. Uh, and, and to your point, it was it was basically it ended up being a data entry job. Um, and this was while he was in college. Um, and, uh, he asked his supervisor, he said, well, this, I, you know, I wouldn't need to do this. I could write some software to just do this. And, and you know, of course, his supervisor was like, well, you can do what you want as long as all the data gets entered. And, uh, and so he did, he wrote an automation script, um, I think in Excel, I guess I'm not a hundred percent sure, but, uh, but he wrote an automation, uh, system and, and got the work done. Um, and of course they loved him for it, but on the, you know, downside, um, then his internship kind of ended a little bit early because all the data had been entered. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, it was in the end, it was good. It, it, mm. That, that uh, experience helped him land a job when he got out of college. So. Yeah. Because that goes straight into your resume. So, mm. so, uh, so I think one of the things that people overlook as, as they're going through their education is, is they should have on the side their resume constantly being built and kind of massaged because you need a job, right? Well, what happened to me and what happens to a lot of people when they go through college, they're so focused on just getting good grades and learning because learning is so much fun. I mean, I spent years and years and years in college just learning stuff, right? because it was fun i never wanted to graduate that because it's it's fun and easy to to just keep learning but it's but when you have to actually get a job then it's a lot more serious but if someone would be building it slowly uh, when they have a class project they turn it around and you know make it a little bit more professional right these days put it on github and uh collaborate and so on so I, I mean you can imagine that resume building is important right, you're you're a, a CTO uh, at Magenic and you've you've been in a position that you hire people all the time right so from your point of view what are you looking for in new developers or maybe people with just a year of experience yeah I'm fortunately able to answer that from, a, I think, a couple different perspectives. Um, the company that I work for, Magenic, um, does, and for 
well, well, well over a decade now, we've had what we call our delivery center, where uh, we do in fact hire people um, right out of uh, school or or people that are maybe transitioning from one career to another and are, are you know have just uh, kind of retrained themselves. So it's not not always young people, but more it is more often than not. And um, so in in that context, you know, what's interesting is we most of our work is web development. Um, or .NET backend or Java backend work, um, and we and we do some other things, but those are the big ones. And very few universities actually teach any of the above, um, at least not at the level that you yeah. can just walk in and do a job. And so it, it, we hire for people that um, sh- can show either, like you said, through their resume, uh, through their LinkedIn profile, and especially through interviews. Um, that they're adaptable in their thinking, that they love learning, um, that they're good communicators. Um, Because it turns out, of course, we, uh, Magenic is a consulting company. So, um, yeah, the the other thing that's gone from my early career is the idea that programmers are people you put in kind of a dark back corner and feed them pizza under the door. (laughs) 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 That that used to be the the stereotype. Yeah. And, uh, um, boy, that is not true now, man. It's it's if, if you can't if you're not a competent writer, uh, like like you know spelling and grammar, and you you can't competently sit in a group and speak uh, and and be organized in your thoughts, um, and and you aren't constantly uh, able and willing to be learning new things. And you're, you're gonna have a rough time, uh, yeah. you know, because those are the attributes that we look for. So, especially because you are a client service company and you're not necessarily building a product, but your consultants are the product that you, uh, they're bringing the revenue. So, uh, right. and I've done, you know, I've been in, in consulting for many years, so I completely understand that. But people who have not had that experience, they may not know the difference. Uh, consulting requires a, a certain different type of developer i think uh, not just technically savvy but also be able to act like an entrepreneur i think that that would be my um, you yeah, may uh, hmm? yeah that's that's uh, you know if i if i can i'll con- compare and contrast because right. i look back at my career and I, i've i i have not ever done a whole lot of job hopping um, which you know, I know a lot of people do, but I, I didn't. I, I so my first real job after I, I graduated from college, and, and I phrase it that way because I had the economy was not good when I graduated, so I had a bunch of not good jobs. But right. My first real job um, was working for what's called an ISV or independent software vendor. So right. that, that's a company that builds software, and the software is the product. Right, and so. Um, that, that by itself was an interesting thing because my job, um, amongst others, it was, it was a fairly small company, but there were about a dozen of us whose job was to build the software that was being sold. And um, that has a, its own set of pressures and challenges and probably is the closest I ever came to being in a spot where you could be put in a back room and, and they could slide pizza under the door. Right? Yeah. Because, um, we didn't interact directly with customers. Um, although I did, I had, uh, again, this is a career thing, right? I did have the writing and speaking communication skills. And so after being there for a period of time, um, they're like, Hey, actually we should have Rocky talk to this customer. Um, yeah, which not, that was not true for most of the developers. Um, so it's, it, you know, shows the value of those other skills. I left there and I worked for a, a biomedical manufacturing company uh, in an IT group. And that's a whole different dynamic because in that case, the company was actually making biomedical um, you know, products that they were selling. Mm-hmm. And in IT, our job was to automate away people's jobs. That doesn't make you friends. Yeah. Um, or to um, save the company money or to be more efficient. Um, and so we were always looked as a cost that, boy, if we can reduce the cost of IT, that would be good. Uh, that means firing me, right? <laughs> um, 
but, but it's a whole different dynamic. And then, like you said so very well uh, regarding consulting, you are the product. You, you know, if you're the consultant, then. And so I've worked in those three settings where I built the product, I supported the people who made the product, and I was the product. And uh, each of those, in my view, attracts different people. And right. and I think this is kind of the key: is we have people that join Magenic, for example. And work for Magenic for a year or two, and then realize that that they don't like being the product, right? They're, they're, they just don't like it, mm -hmm. and so they leave and go find one of those other types of job. Um, and then we have other folks that that thrive on it because one of the advantages of consulting is that you typically move from one project and one customer to another every you know maybe six months to two years, um, but you get a lot of variety. You don't get sucked into the politics of, of your client usually. Um, yeah, so uh, some people love it. And, and for that matter, some people love it for maybe a decade in their career. And then they're like, yeah, that was fun. Now I'm going to go do something else, right? And right. that's maybe my looking back on my career is the uh, – uh, and, you know, and this isn't maybe so good when you get started, but it's something to keep in mind is that you have to give yourself permission um, to take lessons from where you are um, and where you've been and go, huh, yeah, I, I could change. I, I, have, I give myself permission to go find a job that's different from what I've done because maybe it's better. Yeah, and, and there's also, also always some learning to be done. You know, I've mm -hmm. had the opportunity to work in consulting companies and product companies and small companies and very large companies. Um, I wouldn't call myself a job hopper, but I have moved, <laughs> I have changed jobs quite a lot. Um, but I, but I think everybody's situation is different. So if you find yourself in a place where you have room to grow and you have great colleagues and the technology environment is conducive to learning, that's a great place to be, even if maybe you're not getting paid much, you could always make, you know, what you're worth, if you prove your worth, it's, that's entirely possible. But there are a lot of companies, unfortunately, that stifle growth, and they're not really good companies to, to just stay in, and uh, there are lots of politics um, and I have seen uh, my share of those companies uh, where I've, yep. I've seen those companies, uh, you wouldn't believe, you wouldn't believe, I, you probably will believe because you've probably seen a lot more than I did, but I've seen companies where their people are dealing with very sensitive financial data and very, uh, you know, government regulated sort of activities, but they're so cavalier with their software, they just, do something, throw it into production, and hope it works, and then move on to the next thing. I, I've I've seen ho horrendous code being written, and uh, camps, uh, a company where within the company, within the IT department of that company, there are various camps, and fighting and vying for power and influence, and it's it's really strange. So. I wouldn't recommend someone to park themselves there because it's a good job because it may not be good for your long term, you know, mental health and your, and your career. So, um, but if you, if, if someone's listening right now and they find themselves in a great company uh, with a mentor like, like you, Rocky, or someone else who is going to, who can actually they can look up to them they can they can follow you know someone's lead that's a great thing to have and i never had it almost never had it in my career but if someone out there you can find someone like that to follow or a great a great uh, group of people that that you will learn from they're they're empathetic and all that all more power to you and keep going yeah i agree entirely I, i've been fortunate in that I've had a number of mentors that I've either worked for or worked with or, or have met in the industry, um, at, you know, that I never have worked with directly at all, but have become mentors, um, or, or, uh, you know, people that I've wanted to emulate, you know, I, I look at and I'm like, ah, oh, I, I like the way that person does a certain, you know, thing. I, I want to be more like that person. Um, and, uh, 
Yeah, but like you said, I've I've had a couple times where I've had bad bosses, um, and I didn't stick around real long. And uh, an awful lot depends on your boss, um, that's for sure. Um, but but you know, even in those cases, I took away in my case things that as I went through my career, I'm like, you know, I never want to do that, right? Like I, I had a boss that stole ideas. Oh, well, stole cre- stole credit, really, right? Mm. You would have us as a team, you know, do things, and then he right. would go up and go, "Oh, look what I did," you know, oh. um, and uh, and not ever echo that or reflect that credit down into his team, and you know, that's just bad leadership. Um, but you know, it's uh, you know something that I it, and it felt for me, of course, felt horrible, right? Right. I'm like, man, when I when I get in a spot like that, the last thing I'm going to do is hog the glory, right? That's the, the glory. You know, should be spread and echoed, reflected back into the team that did all the work. So, right, it's simple things like that. But, but I think I've noticed people tend to focus on, boy, you know, this was positive and I learned something from it. But it's maybe more important to look at things that were negative in your experience and and learn from those. Yeah. Um, if nothing else, is things not to do as you progress through your career. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Be, be, be better than, than that. Right. right. So I've never had uh, an experience in my career that I didn't benefit from later. Uh, like you said, sometimes it's, it's because you, you learn something what not to do, but there's always some good in the whole lot of bad. You can also take away mm-hmm. some good nuggets of good. Even when I have to, to deal with archaic programming languages and really, really backward software systems seemed like dead end, but I still learned something, which was amazing. I, I never appreciated it at the time, but I did later, many years later. Well, you, you mentioned that, and I think that is something that I found too, you know, arcane or, or quote unquote dead technologies or, or whatever. And, and I've had people that, that have worked for me over the years that have, have balked at that and, and even, you know, switched jobs or, or whatever because they're like, oh, man, I'm, I'm stuck using last year's technology. And I'm like, you know, so on one hand, I get it because our industry moves really rapidly. Um, but on the other hand, it doesn't, it, if you step back after, you know, a few decades or whatever of uh, perspective, it actually doesn't move that fast. And um, you know, so it, it's true. You don't want to be uh, caught on the back end of some technology that's years old. Um, but at the same time, uh, for most of us, it's not necessary to be on the, the bleeding cutting edge. Um, mm-hmm. In fact, our industry works on a bell curve, like so many things. Right. And so on the leading edge of the bell curve, everybody's out there learning the you know, latest and greatest stuff that, that may or may not even ever come to reality. Right. Um, and that's kind of fun if that's right, if that's <laughs> your thing. On the back end of the curve are the companies that will only upgrade their software because the current software is going off support. Right. These, these are the companies that only recently got off Windows Server 2008 because they were forced to. Um, or maybe still run Windows Server 2008 because, well, it hasn't broken yet. Right? <laughs> um, and and I, I've never enjoyed working in that setting because that's, you know, your, your skills do stagnate if you're that far yeah. back. But in the middle, where most companies are, where most developers are, right, because it's a bell curve, um, there's a pretty wide array of, you know, like, like Java 8, for example, with Spring Boot is the absolute mainstream. Um, and yet Java, what, 16 is coming out or just came out? So, so you know, you could argue that, that boy, I want to be over here in that leading edge right. of all the coolest, latest, and greatest Java. And, and that can be fun. But if especially if you're looking for a job, you're not going to find too many jobs because most companies are still back here doing Java 8. And that's, that's right. Yeah. You know, and, um, you know, and, and it varies, right, you know, between the Java and the Microsoft and the web and everything else. But the point being, um, it, you can't always assume that the, the bleeding edge is where you belong. Um, now, now, 
I'll flip that around and say it depends on you as an individual too, right? right? Some people will never be happy unless they're on that bleeding edge. And, and it's going to take work to be in jobs that you can do that. A lot of people, especially when they start having kids and a mortgage and, uh, you know, like, yeah, actually being in that <laughs> middle of the bell curve. Yeah. I like that. Right? It, it, right. it changes, but it doesn't change too fast. And I have time for my kids. Um, and then, and I don't mean to be disparaging, but I've observed that late in people's career, sometimes they fall into that latter end of the bell curve where they're like, really, you know, if I don't have to learn anything new for the next five or eight years, I could retire <laughs> I, <you> know, <laughs> knowing what I know. Yeah. yeah. And, and so um, it, it depends on the person. <laughs> no, that's, a, that's exactly right. Uh, and everybody's different. And this is the beauty of the software industry that every type of personality, every type of technical background, every type of skill set can be accommodated because there are so many different types of jobs for all those types of people. Uh, what I'd like to tell people is that if they're not sure that they're cut out for this, uh, this techno, you know, being a software developer or anything to do with software because they feel like they need to get a, a, a degree in computer science and they have to go through some kind of program to do that. They need some kind of permission. Um, I think that they might be surprised. It's a lot. Uh, most people will be able to do this, I think. I, I think that you're absolutely right. You know, I, I did get a computer science degree, and it, it has been valuable to me. But um, you know, one of my best friends uh, did not. In fact, he never got a four-year degree. Um, and, and I consider him a peer. He and I are, you know, we do yeah. much the same things. We talk about the same stuff and, and, uh, you know, and, and he taught himself to a large degree and, and learned from others. Right. Yeah. But, but, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, one of my best friends, uh, son went to school to be, to get a computer science degree after a year. He's like, man, this is just not for me, the school part, right? Mm -hmm. And so he went to uh, an 18 month or 12 month, um, you know, very just, he's like, I don't care about all the liberal arts stuff. I don't, I, you know, I don't want to waste my time learning history or whatever. He went to the school, learned how to, you know, do some, uh, you know, just tangible skills. And um, now he's, what, five years into having a great job. So, um, yeah, you, you know, you're absolutely right. You can be completely self-taught. You can get a degree. Um, you, some of the best developers I've ever worked with, um, had degrees in things like English or math or physics. Um, and, and somehow as they were, you know, going through whatever life led them, they fell in love with programming. <laughs> and, you know, the thing about programming, and, and I think you kind of hinted at this, especially in today's world because of the internet um man the resources that are out there if you've got the passion i mean if it, if it lights your fire so you wake up in the morning you're like man let me have it <laughs> um yeah you don't necessarily need any sort of fancy degree or formal training because it's it's all out there yeah that's exactly right it's a not only that i'm trying to do something here so not only that, it's a, uh, you can choose your path, as you said earlier, that someone could be doing, uh, getting into product development. If you want to start, uh, if you have an idea for an app, you can do that. Do it yourself. You could do it with a group of people. Now you have a startup company. You could work at somebody else's startup idea. That's all product development. Or you could say, uh, no, I don't want to do any of that. I just want to work at a, a large bank or a, a large insurance company because that gives me stability because my dad did that and that's what I want. Okay, go there and you can make sure that their servers are up and their databases are working or you can make sure that people can do work. All of that requires software. Or you could say, None of that. I just want to work on something for six months and then I want to work on something completely different for another six months. Uh, you could work for a company like Magenic and then 
here you go, you are, you're doing completely different things. And later on in your career, you could say, I'm done with all of that. In an earlier episode, uh, I interviewed my friend Matt, who is a, who just quit doing software development and management, and he, now he's an instructor. Now he's, mm-hmm. he teaches p- other people to code. There's a huge need for that. So there's so much to do. There's not enough people to do it. This is a great field to be in right now. Uh, the reason I'm saying that is because people have come to me. You would not believe how many people I've talked to that will come to me and say, I really want to do this, but I don't have a degree. I really want to do this, but I don't know if I can. And and when I tell them, you don't need a degree. You don't even need to go to a code code academy. You, there, is a, there is a very simple, straightforward process that you can follow to get your foot in the door. And then it'll, it goes from there. It takes time a few months maybe a year mm-hmm. but but yes you can do it and i found reluctance on their part so one of the reasons i started this podcast is to is to give them this encouragement that i feel a lot of people out there don't have because we have a lot of content for people who are sure who know what they want who know what who are go-getters who are going to learn uh, technologies by reading books or, or watching plural site lectures and all that but for the rest of us for the rest of the the world you know, we need you know something softer so this why <laughs> this podcast <laughs> is trying to be that so uh this has been a great uh a, a, i had a great time talking to you rocky and people out there, they, I think it would benefit from your words of wisdom, your advice to people who are starting, people who maybe they want to write a book, or maybe they want to be a CTO in 10 years, or maybe they, they, they want to start, but they want someone to, to give them some words of encouragement. Do you have anything to say to them? I do. I think it's really, uh, a matter of finding what ignites your fire and following that. And, and it might be programming and, and it might not, it might be something else and that's fine. You know, graphic design, user experience, all of the, in Magenic, we've got like 18 different communities of practice that all surround our application development efforts. And most of the 18 are in fact, not application development. Um, but yet they're still in our industry. And so I think that kind of is the thing is, um, find what lights your fire and, and what you, you know, what will get you up in the morning to pursue it. Be a little bit patient. Don't always be jumping at the newest, latest and greatest. Stick with it and learn the lessons that you've got from, uh, in your current spot from a people perspective, from a business perspective, from a tech perspective. And then figure out what the next thing is that'll light your fire. Because <laughs> um, we're this is this is a marathon, not a sprint, right? We're we're looking at careers, not not just a, a one year job. So um, that's that's kind of my high level summary of the way I think about the world. This is great. So on the screen right now, you can see the email at us at mentoringdevelopers dot com. The link for this episode is mentoringdevelopers.com slash episode 87. And in the description, if you're watching this on YouTube, you'll find the links. We're going to have links to Rocky's website and anything else he likes to share. And uh, I would want to know if you have a question for, for Rocky, for myself. So go ahead and email me at us at mentoringdevelopers.com. And it was such a pleasure to have you. And there's so much to talk to you about. I, I hate to ask you to, to, to waste your time and give us some of your time. <laughs> but if, but if you can, would love to have you. And I would, I want to talk about specifically CSLA.net, which is a framework that, uh, you authored. I don't know, know anything about it. So it's, I'm very curious to see what it is. I wanted to know. What motivated you to do that? And if someone else had this idea of doing it, what are the pitfalls? Uh, I know that you, you've written books and uh, someone who would like to write a book himself, I, I wanted to know, okay, what are the challenges? Uh, how did you pick the, the topics and how did you research and so on? There's so much to talk to you about. If you have time, we'd love to have you again. 
Well, I would love to come back. This uh, was absolutely not a waste of time. This was wonderful, and I, I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, and we'll uh, make sure to go to the links in the description. Okay, we'll see you guys later. Bye.